Welcome to The Search, brought to you by Fintech Abu Dhabi 2021. Our Master of Ceremonies is Nahil Hanna. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour et bienvenue à notre cinquième édition de Fintech Abu Dhabi. Hello everyone and welcome again to our global tour. Today, we are visiting France. We are in the iconic Le Louvre, not from Paris, but from Abu Dhabi. It's my pleasure to be your host for today. I am Nahil Hanna, Head of Innovation and Startup Ecosystem at Unbound. We proudly power the search and the FinTech Abu Dhabi Festival. I want to say a personal thanks to you for tuning in on behalf of your host, the Abu Dhabi Global Market. Apart from the fact that we are broadcasting live from a historical location, Le Louvre, we also engaged with many interesting ecosystem partners and with many community partners, both in France and here in Abu Dhabi. BPI France, La Place Fintech, Station F, the biggest academia in France, INSEAD and INSEAD Fintech and Blockchain Club. We could not have made today happen without you. A special thank you to the French Embassy in Abu Dhabi and Business France for their help and support. And of course, our knowledge partner, ADGM Academy. Our team has produced this broadcast to be informative and inspiring for you. We have gathered a superb group of mind for you to learn from over the next hour. So let's kick off. First, we're starting with a presentation. How does digital transformation happen? The MasterCard case, their ecosystem transformation journey, the change of mindset and how they innovate differently. Presented by Andrew Shipilov, professor of strategy at INSEAD, interview powered by INSEAD. Hello everyone and welcome to the session What Makes Business Ecosystems Succeed? My name is Andrew Shipilov. I'm a professor of strategy at INSEA. And I've been working over the past 15 years of how companies build ecosystems. I have written articles both in the academic journals and also in the practitioner journals. I've also written a book, Network Advantage, How to Unlock Value from Your Alliances and Partnerships. And I worked with many companies uh, that have either built ecosystems or helped others build ecosystems, and Google uh, is, is one of them. But today, we're not going to be talking about Google. We will be talking about MasterCard. And MasterCard is a very interesting company that uh, transitioned from uh, an organization which was basically a payment system, a provider of credit cards and debit cards and payment services, to something else, to an organization that is going around the world and trying to identify markets where there are inefficiencies. And this company now is removing these inefficiencies from different markets, connecting different market participants more effectively than they could have connected before. It collaborates with its partners, it innovates differently, and as a result, it is transitioning uh, into the new marketplaces. Uh, and as you can see on this slide, they did have a, quite an evolution of their logo. Um, because on the bottoms of the screen, you see MasterCard, MasterCard with capital C. And of course, in the old logo, MasterCard with capital C was that this is a company which is providing payment services and is providing cards. And then over some years, they've decided that, well, maybe not quite the company that is about just cards, where are a company that does not compete with other card providers, we are a company which competes with cash. And at some point, we have the word card going down to the capital C. And then we have the final stage of their evolution where there is no MasterCard in the logo. You just see two circles, and this is how MasterCard would like us to know it now. 
It doesn't want us even to think that this is something related to cards. This is just a digital platform that is eliminating inefficiencies from markets all around the world, building technological infrastructure to partners for, for partners and building ecosystems in, in different countries. So what we will cover in the next uh, few minutes is a very brief overview of a case study on MasterCard that I have written with a colleague of mine, uh, Nathan Furr. And uh, we're going to review the changes in MasterCard strategy. We're going to briefly take an overview of their approach to ecosystem building and innovation. And uh, I will show you a small conceptual model as to how organizations can build the link between their mindset change, innovation, and ecosystem building. So let's begin with MasterCard strategy. So the original strategy way back when was when the company wanted to compete with Visa, wanted to compete with American Express, so it wanted to compete with other payment card uh, issuers. But then they realized that in the world, only 15% of transactions are done through credit or debit cards and 85% of transactions are done with cash. And this is why the CEO of MasterCard, Mr. Ajay Banga, had a vision that the company does not need to compete with Visa. It does not need to compete with American Express. It needs to compete with cash. So if you ever read the book about Blue Ocean Strategy, you might have heard the term non-customers. So non-customers are the people for whom neither you nor your competition is competing for. And in MasterCard's case, those non-customers were the people who were using cash. And for them, the big strategic move was to reach out to those people who were using cash and who were not using credit cards and bring them into MasterCard's business model so that from non-customers, they could become customers. Uh, but I think the best person to speak about their transition from a card company to a payments provider and then to somebody who is taking people who are using cash and uh, turning them into the customers of digital payments would be Ken Moore, who was in charge of MasterCard's Innovation Lab. So Ken has been instrumental in the transition of MasterCard that I've described. I will give you a little bit of a, a preview as to the thoughts that he has shared with us on one of the webinars, and then we'll come back and then we will review what he has been uh, discussing with us. We have huge businesses in identity, in data, in cybersecurity, and all these other spaces. So a big part of the drive for us uh, to embrace digital was actually a fundamental understanding of how we see ourselves. I mean, Ajay talked to Ajay, our, our previous CEO, but this would be very much uh, in line with Michael, our current CEO's thinking. Ajay would have talked about the war on cash, right? And then how um, we really took on the mission uh, as a company to stop competing with uh, other companies that were out there because actually 85% of all transactions in the world were still happening with cash. So why compete for just the 15%? Why not really reframe who we're competing against and go after the 85%? But even since we did that original um, uh, kind of mandate and mission, we've evolved that a little bit more. And how we see ourselves today, we don't see ourselves as, uh, uh, as a cards company. We don't see ourselves as just a payments company. We see ourselves as a technology company in commerce. And when you see yourself as a technology company in commerce, it frames the kind of things and the kind of assets and the kind of way that you go to market. It also frames the opportunities that you go after. And so therefore, we've been over the past number of years, both through acquisition and through organic growth, we've been really, really pushing hard to serve new customer segments. So business banks, uh, new types of merchant categories, online uh, marketplaces, governments, um, uh, MNOs, telcos, etc. And in many of these spaces, we are uh, we're not an incumbent brand, right? We most of our uh, relationships, most of our history, most of our strength is with issuers, with acquirers, with the retail banking space, and, and with uh, consumers. So in some of these spaces, we are a disruptor. And when we're a disruptor, we have to use technology uh, as a disruptive force. So we need to create and embrace technology ourselves 
uh, to really create the products and services that are going to delight uh, into those ecosystems. So here is Ken Moore. And uh, what's interesting about this conversation, he's opening up new opportunities for MasterCard to innovate, for MasterCard to build digital platforms. So here is one example as to how MasterCard could create and has created new interesting opportunities in London. In this case, we're talking about the uh, city, uh, city of London and uh, the specific uh, customer for MasterCard was the Transport for London. And Transport for London, as you know, for those of you who, most of you, I think, who've been uh, to the UK, it's a very efficient network which uh, transports people uh, across, across this uh, major, uh, major city. One of the problems that Transport for London has is the peak load, where uh, lots of customers go into the subway, go into the bus at the same time, which creates congestion, which creates challenges in managing not only the uh, flows of people, but also maintaining the infrastructure and uh, making sure that there are no accidents happening. So the, in the ideal world, the Transport for London would like people to go to the tube, not at the same time, but to spread people uh, over a certain period of time so that they would so go into, this, into the public transportation gradually. So how could a company like MasterCard help? Well, MasterCard is behind setting up the payment infrastructure for the Transport for London. So every time you go to London and you scan your card to enter into the tube or enter the bus, this would be the system which MasterCard helped create in partnership with Cubic Transportation Systems. So MasterCard and the Cubic and the Transport for London, they have the aggregated data about the passenger flows. And then they could partner with an organization like Starbucks that could give coupons to people so that they go to the tube later. So instead of, for example, me, Andrew Shipilov, entering the tube at nine, maybe I'm gonna get a coupon which will say, go to Starbucks at nine o'clock and you will get a free coffee or a free donut. And if I go there within that narrow time period, I am obviously in Starbucks, I'm waiting in line for my coffee or donut, or I'm consuming coffee or donut, and maybe I'm entering the tube not at 9, but at 9.15 or 9.20. And if there is a large number of people like me who are nudged away from the tube, then that's going to low, lower the peak load in the system, and that would allow the Transport for London to reduce its costs. And the infrastructure which MasterCard has built does allow for this passenger uh, nudges, for this uh, passenger management. And it has something to do with payment, of course. I go there, I pay, and this is how MasterCard get paid. But also, I am, you know, I'm here uh, as, a, as a customer who is not just the customer of the Transport for London, I'm also the customer of Starbucks. And this whole ecosystem that MasterCard has created is about managing my travel experience from point A in London to point B. So another example of interesting innovations that MasterCard has brought uh, to, to a different part of the world is the uh, mobile payment infrastructure that they created in Africa. And they've created a number of really amazing uh, payment solutions and ecosystems in Africa. One of them is called uh, Coupa, and it's a new mobile solution from MasterCard, which allows parents, schools, and governments to make and track school payments uh, while opening new pathways for community access to other important services. So in some African countries, education in schools uh, is expensive and it's not free. Therefore, the families and the extended families of children have to crowdfund, collect money to pay for the children's education. MasterCard can help. They set up a system that allows this crowdfunded payments to happen. The same system could help track attendance of pupils and teachers at school. So meaning that if you've paid, if you're an uncle and you paid the part of your, um, uh, your relative's uh, study at school, you would know whether this, uh, this child has received education, whether this she, she, or, uh, she or he has been at school, and whether their teachers were also at school. Now, again, MasterCard would probably make money on the payment transaction, but 
it will uh, the added value to the customer becomes the crowdfunding opportunity and also attendance tracking of the pupils and the teachers. So the, the strategy of MasterCard then becomes building an ecosystem around uh, the customer experience. In this case, the customer experience is to get the education and then use payments to monetize uh, MasterCard's investment in this, in this ecosystem. In another example, MasterCard has built uh, an ecosystem which they call MasterCard Farmers Network. So in this case, the pain point they're solving not about education, but it's about making sure the farmers in Africa can uh, earn their livelihood in a fair way and that they can grow their produce and they would not be ripped off by the distributors who would be picking up this produce from them. So imagine a situation. You as a distributor received an order for a thousand kilos of avocados or of bananas or whatever produce you, you would be uh, trading. Through MasterCard uh, Takuzi network, you could send the request for a thousand kilos of this produce. And even though individual farmers may not be able to deliver that on their own, the system will split the, the request into multiple lots, and then the farmers can build bid for 100 kilos, for 50 kilos, for a smaller lot. Once that bidding is done, the farmer pledges to deliver these products. Then there will be a delivery person who will come and pick it up and deliver these produce to the distributor. And then everybody rates each other. The farmer rates the distributor, the distributor rates the farmer. So there is the trust and there is the reputation building mechanism in the system that allows the farmer not to be taken advantage of the distributor. And obviously the distributor can, can rate the quality of the farmer as well. So what's the deal here? How does MasterCard make money? Well, they could make money on again on the payment transactions, but they're not just providing the payment per se. People are not paying for the privilege of payments. In this case, MasterCard is providing solution to people uh, to eliminate frictions from the agricultural markets. Now, you could ask the question, how did MasterCard come up with all those wild ideas? After all, it became, uh, be began as MasterCard with capital C. It was a card company. So Ken's team, which was in charge of innovation at MasterCard Labs, were in charge of building a process of innovation inside MasterCard to make sure those ideas are not only born, but also brought to the completion. And the interesting part about MasterCard Labs is that it is not the place where ideas originate, which is a big difference from the traditional R&D labs. In the traditional R&D labs, the ideas originate in the minds of people who work in the labs. And this is interesting. This is a great process. It worked, uh, you know, it worked well in the 20th century. But in the 21st century, where a lot more people in an organization want to participate in generation of the ideas, MasterCard Labs uh, created a different way of looking at that process. So instead of being the origin of ideas, MasterCard Labs becomes the enabler of idea generation process inside MasterCard. Not only that, lab can become a source of ideas for the partners of MasterCard that would come to MasterCard and work with MasterCard employees to come up with new ideas. And MasterCard Labs, under the leadership of Ken, they have uh, created the process of funneling, they call this idea box, where you have three distinct stages, the orange, red, and green boxes. And at every stage of this box, you have a different level of idea maturity. In the first stage, your idea is rough. And maybe all you need is $1,000 to maybe do some research, maybe do some more poking around that idea so that you know, will this idea fly or not? And this is what you're going to get in the first stage, in the first box. In the second box, you will get more money. You will get more money, you will get more time, and your objective would be to deliver some prototype. And if you deliver the prototype, then the next stage would be to uh, test this prototype and see whether this prototype is going to be really working. And this is the final stage where you will get a lot more money and a lot more time to have your idea implemented. And the most beautiful thing about MasterCard innovation process is that as in all innovation processes, most ideas fail. 
So what happens to you as a person in charge of this idea? Well, nothing. In fact, you, you, you ran with this idea for six months. It didn't work. Fine, you're going back to your original job at MasterCard, and hopefully within that six-month period, you actually learn something. So as a result of all those ideas bubbling up through, through the organization, MasterCard Labs have been able to develop a portfolio of related products that help enrich the ecosystems. And some of the outcomes of these ideas I just, I just presented to you earlier in this, uh, in this presentation. So when Nathan and I had been thinking about, so how do we uh, conceptualize this journey that MasterCard have been through, uh, I would suggest that there are really three stages of thinking about MasterCard's uh, ecosystem transformation journey. So first of all, it's the change of a mindset. So we are shifting from the card company to the company that proclaims the war on cash. So we expand our thinking and we're thinking of ourselves about something beyond our core business. Well, MasterCard thinks of themselves as a technology platform that removes frictions. That change of a mindset also can, can, can help the organization to innovate differently, where they have the MasterCard Innovation Lab, which supports internal idea generation. And then they develop a product portfolio, which is a whole bunch of different ideas that they evaluate through different lenses. One of, one of the lenses is client market fit. Does, does the market actually need that innovation that, that is being proposed? The next one is how do we go to market? So what is the best strategy that we take this new idea and bring to market? Uh, have we thought about uh, this approach? And finally, is there money to be made? So this is what they call commerciality. So, so is this idea, if it removes a pain point, if we can bring it to the market, can we figure out how to make money with this idea? And then finally, it's the approach towards ecosystem building where they say, well, we going to monetize the transactions, the payments, but we will bring complementary services on top of them. And we fully understand that customers join because they want to remove pain points. They're not joining us because they want to pay. They have a bigger pain point to remove. And if we can remove that pain point, and if we can uh, collect money through payment, then everybody is a winner. And then finally, what they're building is something we'd call adaptive ecosystems with uncommon partners. So an adaptive ecosystem is an ecosystem where we have multiple players at the core. Just like we looked at the Transport for London, they have, we have MasterCard, we have Starbucks, Cubic Transportation Systems, and Transport for London. We've got four firms at the core of this transportation ecosystem that is enabling not only people moving from point A to point B, but also uh, capacity and load management in the, uh, in, the Transport for London, um, in the Transport for London infrastructure. And then Uncommon Partners is somebody with whom neither, neither you nor your competitors have been partnering with. So just like in the Blue Ocean strategy, we have the notion of non-customers, we can also think about the notion of uncommon partners. So these are new organizations that firms like yours never worked with before for solving these specific problems. And MasterCard have worked with countless NGOs. They worked with uh, countless partners to, uh, with whom they would have never worked with before to identify new ecosystems and bring those ecosystems to the customers. Now, you could say, well, but how does that apply to me? Well, I could suggest to you that maybe if you're thinking about transforming your business or helping somebody else transforming their business, then maybe this is the same approach that you could follow. So first of all is some kind of a mindset change statement. So we want to go from to. So we want to go from something that we do really well to markets where we could take our core competency and use what we do really well in the new context. So just like MasterCard was thinking about how do we take the payment services and move them elsewhere. Then innovate differently. How do we innovate differently from the past? How do we engage partners in the innovation process? How do we engage the entire organization in the collective brainstorming exercise so everybody contributes with their ideas to your uh, innovative outcomes? And then finally, we're building an ecosystem. So we want to resolve some pain points for our customers and monetize our solution to pain points. 
So essentially what we're good at in the from statement, that what we, if we could monetize that in our ecosystem, this is how we're going to create value both for the customers and be able to create value for our organization. So change of mindset, innovating differently, and building an ecosystem were for me the key learning points that I had from, uh, from the MasterCard case study. I hope that case to this very brief case study was useful for you. I hope you're enjoying the conference and thank you very much for your attention. And now let's go back to search. Thank you, Andrew. Very insightful. Now I'm going to tell you about why you are here today. Why France? France, without doubt, has a thriving fintech ecosystem covering all aspects of the fintech space. And while Paris at the moment is home to 1,200 fintechs, according to the room data, there are signs, including an acceleration in funding, showing that France is slowly catching up to neighboring UK. We see the space of fintech growth in France, accelerating the French lifestyle and the reputation of Paris as a finance hub are factors. Investors agree France is seeing an acceleration on the European French tech scene. We are going around the world searching for some amazing startups in fintech and their founders. Today, we are presenting four fintech to watch from the French ecosystem. We will give you a look behind the scenes of some of the leading fintech startups to learn how their innovations are shaping the future of finance. We will also need your help as you will act as our fourth judge. Look at the poll after all the presentations and vote for your favorite startup in today's event. We have with us today Bart Vahren, CEO and co-founder at Invest Suite. He will tell us about how they help financial institutions extend their digital investment offering and capabilities with their AI-based white-label product suite. Next, Luigi Languito, co-founder before AI, a productive cybersecurity. We will know from him how they help organizations protect their networks, brand, and stakeholders by predicting cyber threats before they happen. After, Solofo. Founder and CEO Digit Up, a global e marketplace for funding, selling, and deploying renewable energy products and services. Last but not least, we're going to hear from Alexander Green Grenomi Sustainability, reporting SAS, helping corporates and financial institutions to measure and improve their sustainability levels. We've assembled a stellar lineup of judges who will be assessing the startups and deciding who should become part of the FinTech 100. So let's meet our judges. They will be assessing the startups in a few criteria. Solutions, market opportunity, the impact of their market, their team, their investor, and where do we see the company's growth potential? Once we have heard from all of our startups and had the judges Q&A, we will send the judges off to deliberate. The challenge highlights UAE's rising fintech opportunity and access to the market. The winners also will be given a chance to be part of the FinTech Abu Dhabi 2021 FinTech 100 and the top startups will be invited to participate with their initiative. FinTech 100, one of the world's most important founder and investor gathering happening in November. Founders have a strict two minutes before they will be grilled by our judges. So what are we waiting for? Let's hear from Bart Investsuite. Bart, over to you. Hi, thank you, Julia. So InvestSuite is a white-labeled B2B invest 
tech solution provider. So what it means is that we help financial institutions to launch their digital wealth solutions. Uh, since a few years, investors all over the world are demanding investment uh, to be done in a digital way, and COVID has massively supported that request. Hence, we see a lot of requests actually all over the globe, and in particular also in the Middle East, from financial institutions to launch their own digital wealth solutions. Let's make it very practical. Here in front of you, you see the CBD investor app from Dubai. So they asked us last year to help them out with this. They didn't want to wait five years because it does take a lot of time for a bank to develop and launch such platforms. And we developed that with them and launched it in record time a few months ago. Um, next slide, please. So as InvestSuite, we offer our clients what we call front to middleware uh, products. Typically, they're cloud native, although we can also do on-premise uh, executions. They're very customizable and modular. So imagine that you as a bank or a financial institution wants to launch your own self-investor, your own Robinhood, if you wish, then we can help you doing so as a separate app or integrated. If you want to launch your own robot advisor, uh, like your own Betterment, if you wish, then we have that solution for it as well. The third product, the optimizer, is actually our, the heart of the robot advisor. It's a very advanced portfolio construction framework, and it allows you to apply any universe, stocks, cryptocurrencies, trackers, and so forth. On the right-hand side, you see your personal control room, where you have 150 parameters that you as a bank can set, including, for instance, Sharia compliance, the universe, the markets, and so forth. On the next slide, you see the storyteller, and here we aim to revolutionize the way that portfolio performance reporting is done. Everything that you see there is done in an automated way. But meet the judges. Reem, we'll start off with you first. Thank you. Thank you, Bart, for the presentation. Quick one. So you mentioned Sharia law. Can you discuss more uh, functionalities that you would be considering as you set up here in the MENA region or more specifically in Abu Dhabi? Yeah, so basically, um, so the products would be always the same, like uh, robot advisory, selling investor, allowing uh, retail customers to invest uh, either get advisory or self-directed uh, with, with a platform like Robinhood, if you wish. What we embed in all our solutions are uh, Sharia compliant functions. That means that, for instance, if you want to invest in stocks or trackers, that uh, we allow to parameterize the system such that non-Sharia compliant uh, stocks or trackers or whatever are excluded. And so that's to make it very practical. And that's the same goes for advice. If, and so we are actually uh, focused on the Middle East. Eh? So you asked about Abu Dhabi. So we are currently in Dubai. We are a member of Qatar Fintech. We have investors from the Middle East in Jordan. So we are also doing projects in Jordan, entering Saudi Arabia and uh, Egypt. Excellent. And so that would be Thank keen so to also go to Abu Dhabi. <laughs> got it, got it. Thank you. Over to you, Vishal. Thank you, Bart. Uh, very impressed with Investweed, to be honest. Um, how do you differentiate yourself the, from the rest of the competition, uh, especially here, the GCC? There are a few out there in the market, um, and you've scored big with getting one of the top banks on, on board. How would you differentiate yourself from the rest of the competition? Thank you for that question. Um, I think there are a couple of, of elements, if I may. Uh, so I think, first first of all, that is also um, uh, I think why CBD selected us and some others now. One is that we come with a proven track record. So uh, a lot of us are senior ex-bankers. And I think when you work with banks, it's important to know and understand how banks work and to have done it in the past. So I had the pleasure and in all modesty to have launched a few digital platforms. Uh, and I think they see that. The second thing is we combine, and that's a bit the, the special source of our company, our left brain and right brain. So it means that we have a very strong quant team coming from Fringes Schroeders in London and a very strong design team, so have developed digital uh, apps. And then the third uh, element is, I would say, the back end. So what I see is that there are a lot of players indeed outside focusing on the front end, but at the end of the day, you have to integrate with the bank infrastructure. And I think that's technically very, very challenging. And that's very important where we also have the expertise. So it's a, a mix of all these elements. And specifically to the MENA region, I think we can truly say that we are very committed. I, I, I hope that the banks are feel it. Uh, we have also now people from Lebanon on board. Uh, we have investors from the region um, and we are advancing there quite well. So we also can do our, 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 let's say our products adapted to, for instance, as I mentioned before, Sharia, but also um, in Arabic language. So all these elements uh, prove hopefully that we indeed we have a focus there and that we can as such differentiate as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Bart. Really quick question from me, I'm aware of the time. Um, so you're a, you're a purely B2B company. 
Um, I was just wondering um, if you could let, let us know like where you forecast the majority of your revenue coming from in the future. I know you've got a different, a few different elements to your business model. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. So I think both elements to the question. One is um, from the products. What we see now is that there's a spread over those four products, which is very nice because, for instance, in CBD in Dubai, they have now three of our products. One other is going live in one month, and they also wanted the fourth one. So more and more, we see the spread over the four. Um, if that answers your questions, and secondly, geographically, it's for us Europe and, and Middle East in, in particular. These are the two core areas, although we also have clients now in US, Brazil, and, and Asia, but the core focus is, I would say, on Europe and, and the Middle East. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bart. That's all we have time for today. Thank, thank you. It's a pleasure meeting you. Thanks a lot. Okay, now for our next startup of the day, we will be seeing Luigi from Before AI. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the solution to your number one risk, the risk of cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, we have the first predictive cybersecurity solution in the world. Next, please. So here you see a, a domain name that was registered on the 23rd of April. And in the next 13 minutes, we were able to identify it as a future source of uh, malicious activity. Two days, uh, five, four days later, this domain started to distribute ransomware. Next, please. One month later, before AI pre-crime technology is still the only one that know that that domain is distributing ransomware. You can imagine the protection that we can provide to customers by having this information upfront they can configure their network, they can configure their um, security solution to block traffic and avoid to be under attack. Next, please. Pre-crime is not science fiction. And, you know, we were um, inspired by Minority Report, the movie of the year 2000, in which there was this concept of preventing future crime. Thanks to seven years of research, multiple patents, uh, and thanks to the partners that we have across the globe, also in the Middle East, uh, we have now the capability to help all companies in the world and certainly in the financial space that is the most under attack from cyber criminal to be uh, protected, both with our network solution and with our brand protection solution. We, we protect not only your companies, but also your brands, your customer and your stakeholder in general. Learn more on our Before AI website. Luigi, meet the judges. Vishal, over to you. Thanks, Julia. Luigi, great presentation. And I love the reference from Minority Report, one of my favorite movies. Um, quick question for you. Could you talk a bit more about your strategy of coming into the region and whether you've already had some clientele in the, in the UAE and the wider GCC market? Sure. So we have uh, a distributor called eSolution, part of the Midis group, and they are uh, present in the market since more than 30 years. So they will be, uh, you know, our uh, presence and our arm to support all our customers. Uh, the product is, uh, uh, you know, based on uh, a technology that uh, we run remotely. There is no need to install or do anything particular, but a customer need help to integrate it. And so that's where e-solution will support. So we think that having one of the largest uh, you know, reseller and technology partner out there, you know, they have been partnered for many years of IBM and Oracle and others, uh, is the right way because the specific requirements that locally the company have has to be met by, uh, you know, somebody with already experience. So we are a startup, but, you know, we will interact with customer like we were grownups. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Reem, you're up next, please. Thank you, Luigi, for the presentation. So um, my question is about your revenue stream. Can you tell us more about how you generate revenue? Sure. So our product is a subscription-based product. It can be either sold monthly or annually. We provide what is in the industry is defined as a threat feed or cyber threat intelligence. So it's a feed of information that come out of our artificial intelligence and big data product. And this information then can be consumed by security solution. So from a customer standpoint, uh, you have just to subscribe to the contract with us. 
then we will configure together with your team or thanks to our partners this relationship and this connection of data and then it will be a machine to machine configuration it's an api a driven product so there is no more interaction needed and you know that all your security infrastructure move from a reactive firefighting nature into a predictive and proactive nature thank you okay. very much thank you so much last quick question from me um i think it's really interesting obviously that you're predicting the threats rather than reacting to them um, you have this patent in technology, which is obviously a great advantage. Could you tell us a little bit about your competitors? And, you know, are there other similar products that similar predictive cybersecurity products that um, are on the market at the moment? And how do you compare to them? So we are in the market of uh, cyber threat intelligence. So there are many, many different players out there, but we are the only one truly predictive. What I mean by truly is we do not need to see the network traffic or the content of these domains. You saw from the presentation, we knew in 13 minutes, so the domain wasn't even propagated. You couldn't even access it yet, widely on the internet. Thanks to our sensor, we could see it existed and do all our analysis. But this capability to uh, truly look into just some of the features of the domain and predict the future use, that's only before AI has uh, to today. Everybody else is either reactive, so they have detection, they have sensors, that identify uh, some traffic that is malicious, or they are predictive, but still based on some sensors that provide some early signals, and then they try to figure out what it does, right? In our, the key difference from between our product and the rest of the market is we do it earlier than anybody else, generally between six, six hours to months, like we saw in the example, earlier than any other detection system. And that adds up is what make a true difference into being an active defense in having an active defense for all networks. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Luigi. That's all we have time for today. Thank you. Next up, you. next up, we will hear from Dizitup. So Lofo, right. the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Solofo and I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Dizitup. Do you know that there are today more than 850 million people in Africa out of 1.2 billion people who do still suffer from very poor electricity services? Worst, 600 million people, which represent 50% of African people, could not be linked to their electricity grid. However, at the same time, so we got more than 40 million people uh, African people living abroad that we call African diaspora. Next, please. So we have decided to tackle this issue by building up uh, an Africa first global e-marketplace for founding and deploying renewable energy services across the continent. So we give an opportunity to anyone in the world, African diaspora, to invest. We power on uh, our African households and we get we give return to these investors. Next. It's built on a mobile application called Digitab where there will be African renewable energy merchant and also utilities providers and everyone in the world, in Africa and in Europe and States, could buy products and services that will be installed by African people in Africa. Today, we are presenting two countries in Madagascar and Togo with showrooms and shops. And we are deploying our services in Benin and Nigeria. And uh, I mean to have 22 countries in five years. Thank you. Solofo, please meet the judges. Reem, please may I ask the first question. Thank you, Solofo, for the presentation. Um, so my question is about the competitive um, um, market. How is Digitup unique from the different competitors um, in, in Africa, more specifically within the sector? Um, our uniqueness is brought by the fact that we have a global marketplace where we are going to sell our own product batteries and PV solar called DZBox, 
but also we let everyone to sell their product and services within the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's unique. No one is doing that. In fact, we have built up a kind of an Amazon plus PayPal dedicated for renewable energy in Africa. Okay, understood. Thank you, Salofo. Vishal, you're up next, please. Thanks. Um, very interesting uh, platform. And it's like a marketplace, like you correctly said, for energy for the entire continent. My question is, given that there's so many players within that marketplace, uh, utility service providers, payment service providers, I'm sure there are a couple of financial institutions as well. What's your revenue model? Um, I'm, I'm thinking you would need a lot of mass adoption to make money off this. And you'll be in the red line for quite a few years. <laughs> okay. Um, in fact, we have two free uh, revenue streams. One is a, a gross margin that we're going to have from the, uh, our own devices called this book that we're going to sell on the 10 countries uh, 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 that we will be present. This is basically sales. The second revenue is more, very more important is the sales transaction that we will cut from our partners' competitive sales on the marketplace. And we are targeting all countries in Africa where anyone, you know, a shop based in uh, Bujumbura, in Lagos, as well as they do sell renewable energy stuff, he could list his products and services there for free with not uh, without any uh, subscription payment, but we, we take a full percent cut at that. And the last one is the, uh, the financial services that we're gonna propose to people across Africa, and then also that we're gonna have um, a transaction there. So at the beginning, there will be, I would say, sales transaction for the box that are gonna sell, but definitively in five years, the company will be seen as a fully 100 fully 100 percent as a fintech company which thank is you. less capital intensive business thank, thank you Salofo. uh one last quick question from me um i just wanted to know what you would say that your top priority is in in the next six months and what metric are you watching most closely Three uh, top priorities, Op uh, expanding quickly in Benin and Nigeria, which is uh, in on, the, on, on the road right now. Second, to success via the newly uh, royalty crowdfunding that we've launched last week called Energies Africa, which means that we build up the Af Africa first crowdfunding platform for funding our equipment. And we are raising 1 million euros of that in one year. So in the next six months, we need to reach 500K at least, but I think we're gonna do better. Right? And the last is to prepare the next year big bank because we are building up a system that should be expanded quickly. So that's why moving to Abu Dhabi is something uh, that um, gonna help us to do that. Finance is not for us just a mean, it's part of our strategy, so. That's it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lofo. That is all we have time for today. Thank you. Next up today, we will hear from our last startup, Greenamy. Thank you. Hello, I'm Manik Stevens, CEO of Greenamy, uh, Green Rectech based in Brussels. Next slide, please. Now, sustainable finance is booming uh, around the world, and so are sustainable finance disclosures requiring corporates, but also financial institutions to measure the sustainability level and share it with the public. Next slide, please. In Europe, um, what we've done at Greenomy is codified as thousands of pages of sustainable finance legislation and offering fully digitalized tools to corporates through a company portal allowing, allowing them to measure the sustainability, publish their score with the outside world, a portal for auditors that can certify this ESG data, and portals for investors and lenders that can screen their uh, investment portfolios or loan books, engage directly with investees and uh, their corporate borrowers, and uh, to get their finance their transitions. Finally, we also have an API that helps share this data with any third party that would need it. 
Next slide, please. Now, the idea is to go beyond Merck compliance and reporting. And with this data, tell companies what is the gap necessary to meet their sustainability targets? How do they compare with their peers? And what best practices could they adopt to improve their sustainability over time? Next slide, please. This phenomenon of single finance legislation uh, are, is going across the world. Many jurisdictions are adopting their own legislation. And our goal uh, as members of the Abu Dhabi Single Finance Declaration, working with the ADGM, is to integrate the new single finance legislations in the UAE and allow local players to be part of our global platform. Meet the judges. Reem, please may you start. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for the presentation. Uh, my question is about your team. Can you tell us more about your team and the qualifications that your team has? So we're a team of uh, 15 today, expanding, uh, with various backgrounds, regulation, technology, sustainability. I personally worked at the European Commission on digital finance, sustainable finance, and uh, realized what a challenge this new legislation will be for the industry. And so uh, we have, uh, with this team of 15, we're really are looking into the key problems and see how technology could help implement the legislation faster and help all players to improve their sustainability with the help of technology. Thank you. Vishal, you're up next. Thank you, Alex. A very interesting platform. My question is around what is available to you as a platform in, from a data side. Um, there are a lot of regulations and there are a lot of adoption that's already in Europe that is not available here right now in the UAE and the wider GCC market. So what is the gap? How do you, how do you say we bridge that gap between the markets? Well, as members of the Abu Dhabi Sustainable Finance Declaration, we're working with local players to understand what are the regulatory developments and when uh, and how will they adopt their own sustainable finance legislation. Once that's done, the next step is really to understand the interoperability between the UAE framework and the European one and any other framework around the world, codify it and create equivalences between these different frameworks so that if a local player does a screening and goes and reach out for financing abroad, they can communicate with each other. So really, uh, the gap that needs to be bridged now is adopt the local le uh, legislation, uh, um, create the equivalence with other frameworks, and make sure that uh, it is codified into the system to allow uh, uh, um, a good understanding of players. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, that's all we have time for today, but thank you very much for joining us, Alex. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our pitches. I'm certain we can all agree that the standard is extremely high. We, the judges, will now go off to deliberate. Who will win a place in the FinTech 100? We'll find out at the end of our broadcast. Nahil, over to you. Okay. That brings us to the end of our pitches. Thank you, Julia. Who will it be? We will know later. Remember, and don't forget to vote for your favorite startups. Please, vote now. While waiting for the results, let's explore and know more about the French fintech market. We will hear from Elias Ghanem, Global Hub, of market intelligence, Cap Gemini. He's going to do a comparison between the global ecosystem and the French ecosystem, talking about successful collaborations, acquisitions between banks and fintech, fintech VCs funding global versus France, and he's gonna also talk about the difference between the UAE market and France. So. We will hear from Elias Ranem, Global Head of Market Intelligence, Cap Gemini. He's going to do a comparison between the global ecosystem and the French ecosystem, talking about successful collaborations and acquisitions between banks and fintechs, fintech VCs funding global versus France, and about the MENA region versus France 
and more. We're going also to hear from ADGM explaining about their digital lab. The digital lab is a community-led marketplace where financial institutions, fintech startups, venture capital, government, and academia interest groups can create profiles to signal their interest in collaborating and connect for meaningful exchanges. It's an open collaboration platform that will help you navigate the UAE market and go to market faster. Elias, Gabriel, over to you. Marhaba from Paris. So I am Yes Ghanim. I am the global head of market intelligence at Capgemini. Capgemini being one of the large consulting firm focusing on digital transformation and leveraging technology. What I will share with you today is really a few slides on comparing the French market to the global market in terms of investment, in terms of how the fintech is doing and the collaboration. And after that, I will share with you some thoughts coming from the region and comparing how the region, uh, the fintech in MENA could work versus a, a fintech out of Europe. So without further ado, let's jump into it. If I were to start with the angle of funding, fintech VC funding global versus France, what can we see? That the 2020 has been an amazing year for fintech. A money flood all over the place. It flood on a total estimated funding in, uh, in, uh, on a global basis to come to almost uh, more than $40 uh, uh, billion. And also more than 1.8 thousand, 1,800 uh, uh, deal on a global basis. And if we look at France, France also had an amazing growth here when it comes to funding. And uh, FinTech got a lot of money and a lot of maturity, global as well as France. And in France, we estimate that we would reach the year with 90 deals into the FinTech 2020. And uh, we are coming to these numbers as we speak now. But if I want to make it more down to earth, because at Capgemini, we really like not to only look at the FinTech as a, a new things, the new chick on the blog, but rather the opportunity to work together. And here, what I want to show you is global versus friend, friends when it comes to collaboration as well as acquisition. We have Goldman Sachs that invested in final and even acquired completely the, the final uh, startup uh, as part of an acqui-hire and looking to bring in the, the new skills. We also have Goldman Sachs recently that also invested into uh, the UK uh, firms called Starling Bank and looking at to see what could happen with it with the Marcus brand. In, uh, in Germany, Dutch Bank and Traxpay uh, getting into the supply chain. Across Asia, DBS and Infor, HSBC and Identity. Clearly, we are seeing the global collaboration and either collaboration or investment acquisition is happening. France is in the same trend. And here, to take the three largest banks, Société Générale, BNP Paribas and Crédit Agricole. First of all, Société Générale, globally known as SOCGEN, uh, acquired China to be into the entrepreneur market uh, business. BNPP partnered with OneUp and into the small business opportunity and offer automated cloud banking. And finally, Crédit Agricole took a majority stake in Lixo for its digital payment services. If we look at it in 2020, there have been more than 200 partnerships across France and more than 57 French fintech got an investment from financial institution. So you could see here that the fintech market in France is very dynamic and the banks are eager to catch up with the ecosystem by acquiring the right partners. But the market of fintech is not alone because what is happening now are the big tech. And I can't finish my presentation without comparing also the bank plus big tech collaboration at the global basis versus France. And what are we seeing across Asia? DBS working with N Group and Unchain to provide SME 
optimal and timely working capital support. We have BBVA selling now, uh, officially announcing that they will be selling their products across uh, Amazon. And Goldman Sachs issuing the Apple card in the US and take it to the world. And finally, Google and Citi, Citi uh, enabling digital banking services and checking accounts through Google. And the one that is now to happen in 2021 is nothing more than the Google Plex, where Google is offering to several banks, including Citi and VVA, to join the go-to market of banking for Google. If we take the same conversation and we bring it more to, to Paris, this is where BNPP and Amazon, BNPP Asset Management, is getting into leveraging Amazon last mile, which are the Alexa of the world, by creating voice activated market commentary and sought leadership through Alexa enabled devices. Impressive to that BNPP will ask, I would go on Amazon and say, hey, Alexa, blah, 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 and towards asset management. We also have BNPP making a deal with WeChat Pay to its retailer partners in Europe to cater to Chinese tourists. Chinese tourists have not been much in France for the last year, we believe that they will be coming quite soon, starting the summer, and they will be more and more looking to be able to engage with the local retailers, but only also in Chinese. And finally, we have Sogen and their, uh, their subsidiary called Bursorama, which is their digital bank, uh, doing a partnership, first banking partner to launch of Google Pay in France. What is happening? Let me give you my point of view, because happened that I am French, I am Lebanese, I lived in the Middle East, and in my previous lives, I worked at PayPal, uh, running PayPal across the Middle East, but also launching a fintech into the Middle East. And to all of you, I want to make a comparison between how is the fintech ecosystem seen from MENA versus seen from France. What is France or what is Europe? Single currency on a given market, large market with a single language, a, a, a population that is aging, and a population that is adopting mobile slowly, and also a population that protects a lot its privacy. So when you bring all that together, it's a different mindset of what we see in MENA. What do we see in MENA? Multi-currency, multi-language, where Arabic, English, uh, French, and you name it, are mixing each other, where accents are quite different from one country to another. And if you move into voice commerce, you need to know that. We're also seeing small markets. There is not a single large market that is big other than Saudi, of course, and Egypt, but all the others are very small. So niche market where you need to be able to grow, to go at scale. Finally, a very young population, extremely mobile native, and extremely risk takers and where data, your data is my data is all over the place and we easily share our data in, in the Middle East. So when you create a fintech into the Middle East, you need to put that into consideration and also very important point, a regulator in each market. The Saudi regulators, quite different from the Abu Dhabi regulators, quite different from the Egypt regulators, and so on and so forth, Jordan, Lebanon, and you name it. So adapting to that is also complex, with also very advanced, different level of advancement in terms of the, uh, the, the opportunity. So think about all that when you build your fintech in the Middle East, and when if you have a mind to come to Europe, understand that the power of the regulator is one, the language, you need to be able to go from English to Spanish to French to German very easily. You have a single currency and you have large population. With that, and now back to the search. Hello everyone. My name is Gabrielle from Abu Dhabi Global Market, Abu Dhabi's award-winning international financial center. Are you looking to interact with leading financial institutions and corporations, access key stakeholders and demonstrate the value of your product, expand your geographic reach? Join the ADGM Digital Lab, the first regulator-led, truly digital initiative to accelerate the growth and scale of your startup. Open to all, regardless of geographic location, the Digital Lab is a one-stop shop to connect the ecosystem stakeholders to explore synergies, and trial innovative solutions. 
The digital lab is made up of two parts. A community-led marketplace where financial institutions, fintech startups, and venture capital funds, governments, and academic interest groups can create profiles to signal their interest in collaborating and connecting in order to explore meaningful exchanges. This marketplace feeds into a digital sandbox environment that is populated with toolkits to generate synthetic data and system images simulating core banking functions and IT operating systems. As a startup, this means you can expose your APIs to our community, leverage our designated testing environment to conduct POCs with financial institutions in a secure and neutral workspace, connect to synthetic data to trial and demonstrate new products and solutions. Interested in joining? You can sign up to the Digital Lab from anywhere in the world. Once your registration is validated, you'll have access to a workspace and the API tools we provide. With user management, you can set up different access controls and invite participants in to conduct proof of concept. The Digital Lab is here to provide a no-frills environment for you to technically prove to financial institutions that you can change the game. The Digital Lab includes a graphical UI to create and configure APIs, container toolkits that enable the replication of core banking systems to test new tech, a workflow user interface where systems and resources are treated as independent, draggable components that can be configured and tested with existing systems without the need to code. ADGM is committed to championing an active, community-driven fintech ecosystem, conducive to concrete business opportunities. Navigate to the Digital Lab community area which includes a forum to spark collaboration, an awards section to highlight top contributors, and a challenge notice board where financial institutions and corporates will post their challenges and invite applications from fintechs with relevant solutions. As a fintech, you can apply to a specific challenge with the goal of piloting and winning a corporate contract. Want to learn more? Sign up here and feel free to email Digital Lab at adgm.com for any questions. We're waiting for you. So it's time to find out who the winners are. Thanks to the team back in Abu Dhabi and thanks to so many of you for voting in the poll. The judges have passed me the results. I think it's about time we found out who the winners are. The winner are... Congratulations to Invest Suite before AI and Grenomi, you will be joining the FinTech 100. Now, that brings us to the end of the show. We are so excited to be involving another three of the world's most innovative FinTechs at one of the world's fastest growing FinTech festivals. We will also be inviting them to participate in our innovation challenge to apply to solve some of the biggest real challenges facing corporates in the region. The winners will join the prestigious FinTech 100 and represent their company at the FinTech Abu Dhabi Festival in November. So please join them and put it in your diary. I'm sure we'll be meeting you physically or virtually at FinTech Abu Dhabi in November. And as previously we've done in the past few years, we have brought you a remarkable lineup of the most exciting speakers in fintech. So please do check ADGM website initiatives and register to join us. But for now, that's all from me. We will be back next week with the next stop of the search where we will travel to Germany to search for and meet the greatest fintech startups there. It's been my pleasure to be your host for today. On behalf of myself, Nahil Hanna, and my teammates at Unbound, the ADGM, our knowledge partner, ADGM Academy, and of course, our ecosystem partners in France and Abu Dhabi, a special thanks to INSEAD for their support. Thank you for joining, and we'll see you next week. Please register to join us at this year's festival, November 22nd to 24th. Register via adgm.com slash ftad. Thank you for joining The Search, brought to you by Fintech Abu Dhabi 2021. We'll see you next week.